but it, that that would literally be like driving your car and then it breaks down and then instead of opening up the owner's manual to see why that light's on you just leave it on the side of the road and you go get another car and that's that's what i feel like with with really any government system as well brian thank you so much for joining me today thanks for having me sorry uh it took us a while to connect but here we are yeah definitely i am really excited for the conversation and uh you used to work in intelligence. Uh, you have a extensive background, law enforcement, intelligence. Uh, never law enforcement. Oh, never law enforcement. Sorry. No, uh, that's okay. But feel free to. It's confusing, but yes. Feel free to explain to the listeners anything you feel like sharing before we move forward. Um, sure. So, uh, yes, I was in the intelligence community. I guess you can say it seems to change every every decade. Um, but I, I joined the military when I was uh, 18 years old, right out of high school. And to be quite honest, I moved my date up because I was too much of a coward to break up with my high school girlfriend. I wanted to blame it on the government. So when I went in, I was selected for the Army's language training program. I spent uh, two years learning Arabic, which put me into the intelligence, military intelligence corps. I did that for 11 years, mainly with 5th and 1st Special Forces groups. So one dealt with Middle East, North Africa. The other, the majority of my time was with 1st uh, Group, which was Southeast Asia. After that, um, that was 2003 I got out. And obviously, the Intel community was a hot place to get jobs. And I love the work. So I went to the Washington, D.C. area first, up to Fort Meade, Maryland. I um, landed a job at Booz Allen Hamilton. And then um, for a certain government client, which the NDAs of these companies prevent me from saying. And then after that, I did about two years there. And then I went down to the McLean area where I worked for SAIC in the Langley area for another government agency as an SASC full-time contractor. And that relationship, just so you know, is we wore full-time workforce. I never saw my company. I reported directly as if I was an employee of that client or agency. Uh, the only difference was where my pay came from and the color of my badge. Um, so I did that for quite some time till about 2012, 2013. And then during that time, I realized, okay, well, Bin Laden is dead now. Most of this ramp up of the intelligence community has been because of Osama bin Laden. Maybe I should get things on my resume that aren't classified. And so I discovered competitive intelligence, which was the only thing I could find that really utilized my skills in recruiting assets and forming intelligence networks on the ground and collecting intelligence for a uh, mission objective. So I did that for quite some time. Uh, I still do some of that work as well for depends on the client. Uh, but the majority of my work, when I got out of all of it, I really, I really wanted to take all these skills that I'd learned. And it seemed that regular people kind of get access to these skills. And, and um, it, some of them are life-saving. I mean, some of them will save you from a stalker or uh, save your business from making a deal with people that mean to do you harm. And so I formed my own company, um, which I'm currently uh, running now with a, a business partner called Centurion Intelligence Partners. And prior to that, uh, I had Stryker Pierce Investigations. And then I'm also now a columnist and a, a contributor uh, and the host of Unrestricted Invasion at DailyCloud.io, which is my wife, Naomi Wolf's um, platform. But uh, she is, uh, I have no say over what goes on there. So I'm just a contributor like everyone else. Um, and that's what I do. And that, and that point of that, where that fits into the whole thing is it allows me, just like we're having this conversation, to share my experience with other people. And maybe someone will find something useful that helps them. Awesome. Yeah, I I mistakenly said law enforcement. I guess to to okay. my mind and to many people's minds, like intelligence work and law enforcement, there's like an overlap there, but they're distinct things. Um, they are, uh, and the, the reason why there's that impression is for two reasons, in my opinion. 
um, law enforcement, like FBI and several others, they are in the intelligence community, okay. but they are in fact, law enforcement agencies, Okay. little insider baseball. No one likes the FBI in the intelligence community. Hmm. Um, so there is not a harmonious kumbaya us against, you know, everyone else. No, it's a very fractured community and they were kind of jammed together after 9-11. Um, and that's also when they formed the DNI or the director of national intelligence who unseated the CIA as the main conduit to the White House for the intelligence community. But also the other reason is in the UK. There is no separation between like counterterrorism and law enforcement as we do here. Hmm. And there was a story I heard, I can't confirm it, but I'm sure it's out there, where the reason why the FBI started liaisoning with our U.S. intelligence uh, agencies, especially for these overseas type work, and the FBI would go overseas for mainly for kidnapping type cases. But the main reason was be, uh, what happened was, I guess, uh, someone tried to subpoena some agency, uh, some intel agency guys, I'm not sure which agency, to go testify in the British court. Of course, we can't have people revealing that they're working here or there because it puts them at risk. It puts their families at risk. It puts their mission at risk. So the FBI has stepped in and, and part of their role in the intelligence community to, is, is to act as a liaison. For such cases where, say, like a, a CIA guy is, they want to subpoena a CIA guy, they send the FBI to do that testimony. Hmm. Okay. So the FBI will take the testimony from the person who they, the other country would want to interview? I'm not really sure how it works, but that's, okay. that's what I, I mean. And it does make sense that way, too, because FBI is a public facing agency versus the CIA is not. Yeah. Why is it that all of the other agencies don't like the FBI? I mean, I have some ideas in my head because I don't like the FBI. and But I don't like a lot of the agencies as well, or at least what I conceive is a lot of the intelligence agencies. Yeah, well, to answer your question, and, and, and I can address that too, because that's a common thing. Um, my experience with the FBI has been 50-50. So the hmm. older, um, you know, SSAs or agents, you know, senior special agents, they were really good. So when I was doing a lot of counterterrorism work, I loved working with those guys. They were um, mission focused and, and just really, really good guys and girls. Very professional, never had a problem. Um, prior to that, though, my introduction to the FBI was in the Southern Philippines right after 9-11 because we were down, we deployed to Mindanao with first group. And because there was a missionary couple, you might recall, who had been taken hostage um, mm. about a year before by the Abu Sayyaf group. Um, this was um, Martin and Gracia Burnham. Because there was a kidnapping thing there, the, the FBI had a right to be there, but it was special forces that owned the, um, the the camp i mean is our you know is our headquarters they're yeah. our guests and you know the attitude was that the fbi on the fbi give me those slides give me all that well that that that's the wrong thing to say to a, a room full of green berets or you know support people like me out in the field they were like no get the hell out of here you know you, yeah. you don't have any authority here so there does seem to be, and I think it's because they're not really embedded for long periods of time. They don't learn the customs and courtesies, or they don't, a lot of them don't seem to respect that just because you might have legal authority to do something, there is a, um, a buy or leave that you need to recognize, especially when you need to depend on your host for everything, including your own safety. Okay. They do tend to forget that. So, uh, this new FBI. I mean, I can't really speak to, I don't know what's going on. I know there was a purge um, of FBI agents where they offered early retirements starting around 2014. And they got rid of a lot of the veterans and the more mature real law enforcement people. And from what I heard, started recruiting from a lot of the woke type schools. Mm -hmm. And that's why you have the FBI that we're seeing today. And 
that doesn't speak for all the FBI agents. Most of the stuff we see on the, the, you know, the news or online, it's usually headquarters because they're the ones that represent their whole agency. My, uh, I know an FBI guy, um, you know, we stand next to each other while our kids play football. Great guy. And is, you know, great guy. Um, but that's the difference between the field and the headquarters. And that's what people have to look at. Two different worlds. Yeah, there's a couple of things there. Um, you mentioned woke and some people will push back and say, well, what is woke? What is woke? You know, they'll, they'll say it's an ambiguous term. And just because it, a term is ambiguous doesn't mean it isn't a real thing. And I'm reading uh, The Psychology of Totalitarianism, totalitarianism oh, good book. by Matthias Desmet. And hopefully I said his name right. And he's a good dude. He, uh, he mentions in there, he talks about conspiracy theories a bit, and he mm -hmm. talks about how a conspiracy theory, what a lot of people perceive as a conspiracy theory, is actually just an acceptance, a wide acceptance of an ideology. So when people see uh, one of the problems with wokeism uh, or being woke and things coming from that ideology is it doesn't necessarily mean everyone who's woke in a field or anything like that is part of a conspiracy or anything, but they're all of the same mindset. So things start to look like a conspiracy. Does that mm. make sense? Kind of. I mean, and that there, there, there are several definitions. So, yeah. um, have you heard of these? I've heard different definitions, but feel yeah. free to share whatever I uh, definition you go by. Sure. Well, you, you might recall a guy named Reverend Tim on one of the spaces we met on, hmm. and he's in Minnesota. So he was, a, we had a nice long phone call and he was explaining. We, it, it was good because he kept saying, you folks all want this. I, and I finally said, what do you mean us folks? And he was talking about white people. Hmm. And I said, you do realize that by saying you folks, it's just as bad as me saying you folks. So. Let's get past that. And he's like, oh, yeah, man, I'm sorry. He's a really nice guy. And But he explained to me when I said woke, he said, do you know what that term means? I said, I have some ideas. So in the uh, American um, black culture, especially in the inner cities, as he, he described woke, it was woke used to be a good thing in yeah. the black communities, according to Reverend Tim, where it meant you had eyes in the back of your head. You were aware of when the cops are coming, you're aware when there's danger in your, your neighborhood. And that, that's what they used to call woke, which it's kind of a cool term that way. But then also if you read, uh, really the history of, uh, you know, the intelligence community or especially the history of the cold war or anything about the history of communism, a lot of people attribute woke to being a Maoist term, hmm. which meant you're awakened from these old, ways of capitalism and the old ways of the ancient Chinese culture. Now you are awake, you are woke. And so when I hear woke and based on some of the activities that the larger woke people that wear that label, some of the activities they've partaken in and, and, and have leveraged against the American people, I tend to lean towards woke being a Maoist term. So when I use it, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I can see that. For me, when I hear it, I think of uh, like there's just this ever shifting acceptance of whatever the wherever the wave is taking people of a certain disposition. And I I didn't necessarily um, link it with Maoism or anything like that, but I mean it's typically a leftist ideology. But it's this it's this ever shifting thing of well, if you're woke, you just kind of I'd take whatever narrative is being thrown at you as long as it's being thrown at you from the right people. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And that, you know, you mentioned shifting language and it's interesting. You said wave. I, I just always remember that movie they made us watch in high school called The Wave. Mm -hmm. And it was about, you know, socialism infecting high schools or something. I forgot what it was, but Back then I laughed, but now I'm like, well, maybe they were onto something. But yeah. um, when you mentioned the language, I was just thinking as well, like that a common tactic of, say, like the common turn in the uh, 
you know, uh, last century as communism was really, really gaining momentum, you know, throughout Eastern Europe and the USSR, um, they would, they would intentionally employ ever shifting language, Hmm. um, as a, as a weapon almost. So you couldn't nail anything down to target it. It would constantly shift. And that that's actually, I'm not saying it is in this case, but that is a, a very, very classic communist, uh, and Marxist tactic. Yeah, I can see that. It's a, it's hard when you're talking to somebody, if they change the definition of something halfway through a conversation, it's like, well, well, what are we talking about now? What are we, yep. what are we dealing with? And, and some definitions are just complex. So there are multiple definitions to something, but I'm talking like completely change a definition for a word or totally. It, it can get pretty frustrating. Yes. <laughs> what is a woman? Um, <laughs> yeah. so there, but, uh, go, go ahead. Um, yeah, so that's, I, I didn't mean to get you off track, but yes. Yeah, no, it's fine. I think, I mean, when I think of, I'm a millennial, I'm 38, I've been around people my age, a little bit older, younger, mm-hmm. and uh, I've come across a lot of people who will use language like, well, the current capitalist system we're a part of, you know, and, and they don't say it outright that they're critical, but you can tell just from the tone that they're taking. And I find it very frustrating because, I I don't know everything about economics, but I like to think about problems all the time. Mm-hmm. And for me, it's like, do we have a bunch of problems in America with the way the capitalist system is run? Absolutely. I think we're living in crony capitalism, mm-hmm. but it doesn't make sense to adopt a system that has killed, you know, tens of millions, if not over a hundred million people every when it's been implemented. Yeah. Um, yeah. just to fix the problems within the current system. Like we can fix the current system without adopting in a completely different system that has destroyed every country it's been adopted in. To- totally agree with you. And I, I would even add to that. Um, why don't we use the current system and actually follow the manual yeah. before we scrap it? Because when I see a long time ago, I was joked about someday writing a book called, you know, uh, use the manual, but it seems all the problems of their system occur when people do not follow uh, the rules of that system. You see what I mean? So, like, yeah. uh, I can think of a million examples, but it, that that would literally be like driving your car, and then it breaks down, and then instead of opening up the owner's manual to see why that light's on. You just leave it on the side of the road and you go get another car. Yeah. And that's, that's what I feel like with, with really any government system as well. I mean, really, if you think about communism, if, you know, God, I know I'm going to get attacked for this, but if you really, and I'm no communist expert, but if you really look at what the, uh, I guess the inspiration for it was at least sold to the people as, if that was real, that, that could actually work. Of course, it totally disregards human nature. Hmm, um, yeah. And it also, especially things like greed and, you know, lust and, and just. So if, if we were robots, it, it could work. <laughs> so yeah. that's, that's how I look at it. I actually look at it the same way. And I've, I've made that point to people when talking about communism, not necessarily on the podcast, because I haven't talked about communism a bunch on here, mm-hmm. but in, in private conversations and comments. I'll say, listen, it's been tried 20-something times throughout world history. And each time it devolves into totalitarianism, mass death, a dystopian nightmare. Mm. There is clearly, because some communists or people who uh, believe in communism will say, well, true communism has never actually been attempted or never been implemented because Mm. it doesn't adhere to the white paper of communism. And it's like, listen, there's clearly something in human nature that prevents that system from ever being possible because you can get rid of the system but the corruption will still be there because the corruption is a human problem not a system problem right i mean that's the way i look at it i would also say though about you know i've been i've been reading a lot more and listening to a lot more experts on communism and um yeah i would even recommend people you know, tune into Josh J. Phillip over there at, at Epic Times because he's 
uh, one of the best academics in, in the history of communism and uh, into modern times. But, uh, you know, beyond him, just everything I've been reading, just reading all the history of China again and sometimes rereading it. I used to think like it failed, it failed, it failed. But now that I see what's happening in this country, such as kind of these attempts to serp- to to just run over the Constitution, like these trials against uh, President Trump, um, they're doomed to failure, yet they do them anyways. Hmm. And so when I look, they know they're not going to win, but it it's almost like when I look back, I used to think like, okay, it failed. It failed. It failed. Why do they keep doing it? But I think when you look at it through a lot of communist eyes, they see it as moving the ball up the field progressively. Like they don't see it as a failure. They see it as, hey, we got this far, take a break, got this far, take a break, because it's everywhere now. And that tells me that it may be. It's not good, but I don't think they so much failed as they struck, pulled back, struck, pulled back, or got beat back. Um, but it seems like now the momentum of it is bigger than ever. And we, you know, we also forget how we, we don't forget, but um, I think even I have overlooked sometimes, like, it's so pervasive that like we created the Chinese communist, we didn't create it, but we are the reason Chinese communist party is here. Yeah. When we insisted that the nationalists uh, arm them um, in during world war two to fight the Japanese. And because the nationalists had them on, on, on their back heels. I mean, they were done. They were pushed all the way to Western China. And because the Chinese communist party was formed prior to, you know, uh, 1949, despite that being its, its uh, you know, official date. But it, you know, it, when, I, when I really start digging into the history of communism, the scariest part about it is it keeps bringing me back to the United States going back over 100 years. And I remember being raised um, thinking the Red Scare was bad and this is horrible. And I'm not so sure anymore. I'm uh, not so sure. Like, I just see this as we think it's gone and then it's there. And I don't think it re, I don't think it flares back up. I think it's always been there much like Hydra in the, uh, the Captain America movies where it's always there under the surface. Yeah. It kind of feels like that way. And, uh, there's a, an interview with a Soviet defector, I believe, uh, his name is Yuri Bezmenov, uh, uh, and it, it was conducted by G. Edward Griffin. And he talks about all this insidious infiltration of like schools and stuff like yeah, that. The subversion. And, yeah, and and when that interview was going on, it probably seemed a little ridiculous. And maybe twenty years ago, it, you can look at it with a lot of skepticism. But now you watch it, and you're like, "Is that what happened?" Because it kind of seems like that's what happened. I mean, they they have infiltrated institutions quite a bit. I mean, in our country, and I I don't know if the Soviet Union was really a. I don't know if that's a relevant thing anymore. But I I do think. I mean, I know the Soviet Union fell, but I I don't know if there's like traces of that really that got left over. But oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm sure there are, but. It seems like China is responsible for a lot of it because obviously China has a lot of power now. And um, how big of a threat is China? I mean, it seems like a big threat, but some people will downplay it and say, no, they're just a country that's just like us trying to <laughs> prosper. And those are the people you got to watch out for because um, yeah. they're undoubtedly uh, making money from China. <laughs> uh, it's It's the most existential, um, potent, terrible threat I think the United States has ever faced in its history, possibly Western civilization. And so as as big of a threat, I guess where people, some people are invested, so they're always going to defend China. Um, some people really believe that people like me, China hawks, are, are not giving, you know, people in China. And I don't mean people, I mean like 
you know, the, the CCP are not giving them mm-hmm. a fair shake. They seem, they wear suits, they do business, they're super polite. And I've worked with, I've worked with Chinese companies. I've worked for and against them in competitive intelligence. The nicest people you'll ever meet, the nicest people you'll ever meet, the manners are impeccable, but they, and I, I've, I've become victim to it. They will, you know, slide that dagger right in the minute you're not looking. And this is speaking for the uh, Chinese Communist Party, not the Lao Beijing. The, it's not the common people. But um, there, it's, it's this big of a threat, I'll put it this way. There is something called unrestricted warfare, as well as disintegration warfare. So I think a lot of Americans and Westerners do not see the threat because they're not recognizing what war is under unrestricted warfare. So traditional kinetic war is what people in the West are used to seeing, such as Desert Storm, Desert Shield, Afghanistan, boots on the ground, guns in hand, tanks, uniforms. Yeah. In unrestricted warfare, these, uh, you know, PLA and the Air Force uh, colonels uh, in uh, China, they looked at Desert Storm and Desert Shield and they were blown away. They were like, Wow. I mean, we cannot be the United States in a kinetic war. I mean, because that was a perfect war and by American standards was Desert mm-hmm. Storm, Desert Shield. Few casualties, precision weapons. It was just such a lopsided um, butt whooping, as I might say, against the Iraqis that like everyone, I mean, it gave the world pause like, whoa. And so the Chinese who've always had the dream, the China dream, which is 2049 China rejuvenation, which is they are the global hegemon by 2049. That's always been the plan. They looked at that. They said, we got to relook this. They came up with unrestricted warfare. And the first rule of unrestricted warfare is that there are no rules. Yeah. And the second rule is everyone's an enemy combatant, as well as every, every place is a battlefield, the boardroom, the courtroom, the marketplace, you name it. So under unrestricted warfare, it's about they focus on what's called they call the software of war rather than the hardware. So the hardware is, again, what you see, the boots, the destruction, the explosions, the bullets, soldiers. That's that's the hardware of war. That's the method of war. They're more focused on the CCP is more focused on the purpose or the software of war. And that purpose of war is to rule the world, essentially. By 2049, they don't care how they get there. And just like Confucius said, I think it was Confucius, the highest form of warfare is to subdue the enemy without firing a shot. So if you look at the objectives of warfare in that way, and you start looking around this country and other Western uh, countries, and if the, the goal is to subdue us and to, to rule over us and get us out of the way, so China can rule over the world. And then you start looking at what's been happening since about 2003, if not earlier, at the hands of the Chinese. A, we're being surrounded geographically. We're being encircled. Um, And I can go over that in a second. But also, we have a person in the White House right now whose first executive orders favored China and made things easier for them. We have half if not more, of our government uh, in the legislative branch who will never say anything bad about China, who still call them a competitor. We have China and Russia having uh, celebrating and having some cake down in Mexico in October or September with the Mexican army, and no one's saying anything about it. We have 80,000, by some estimates, fighting-age Chinese nationals in this country who have swept over the border and no one's talking about it. So some of the warfare that I, I think has occurred right in front of us is uh, what they call elite capture, where certain lawmakers, legislators have been captured through money, through blackmail, you name it, by the Chinese Communist Party. I see our infrastructure is being taken over by the Chinese Communist Party. For instance, CRRC in Springfield, Massachusetts, makes all the rail cars for the Boston metros, the Philadelphia metros, the BART out in California, and more and more. 
And since they've taken over, I'm in Salem right now in Boston on the T, they've had more derailments than ever before. And it's a fully owned Chinese communist company. I've been there. There's a giant, a giant People's Republic flag flying over, which is odd when you come out of Dunkin' Donuts with your, you know, sausage, egg, and cheese wake up wrap and your your extra large delicious coffee to have a Chinese flag there. It blows my mind. So you can see they're systematically taking things over. And once you own all of those infrastructures, food, water, um, land. Okay. Um, uh, the rail cars, uh, parts, the communications we use in our own military, the new base on Cuba. So you can hack the entire country, our northern neighbors. Let's face it, Justin Trudeau pretty much is owned by the Chinese Communist Party. So is Biden. No. Um, my words, not yours. And, um, they're, they're doing it. We're at war and we are. War is being waged on us now because the software of war or the purpose of that war is being achieved in a lot of spaces, and it's so evident. And once you look at it that way, you see war everywhere. And it doesn't make you paranoid. It's just how you have to look at fighting this type of war. I was actually going to ask you if you think Biden is compromised, because it seems I'm not, I'm not a Trump supporter necessarily, but I'm not a I'm definitely not a Biden supporter. I think it's actually kind of I think there's problems. I have my issues with Trump. Yeah. But it seems weird that the narrative that was built around Trump that this was like this focus on Trump as being like the source of all of our problems. And it's I it just seemed a little absurd to me or quite absurd to Blame all of our problems on a guy that was in office for four years when we've mm -hmm. had problems for 50 years. And there's one guy in office right now that's been in office for 50 years. Yeah. So, and I mean, Biden called himself or said he was willing to prostitute himself out and he got yeah. said no to early in his uh, career. And somebody who would admit that openly and and actually do that and try to prostitute himself out to donors and stuff like that i don't think is somebody that's going to change his ways throughout mm -hmm. his career especially as you get more access to donors and more access to uh perks of office that shouldn't be perks in my opinion yeah so totally and i would even say be careful with even saying i want to trust someone who would say that because i see even though I, I literally hate that man, I think he's an enemy of the state as a veteran, as a combat, disabled combat veteran, having seen those poor men and women in Afghanistan get just sacrificed. I have nothing good to say about it. I wish nothing good for that person. But I will say this, I anything the media says, like if he said that at an open forum, let's not forget Joe Biden during the Obama administration. He's a freaking buffoon. Um, he just has logaria beyond belief. And I'm not saying he's innocent. I am saying that we've seen them do this out of context stuff with Trump as well. When Trump said yeah. he's going to be a dictator as clearly he's being sarcastic. Um, the minute I, he said it, I was like, oh, they're going to, here we go. That's going to be the narrative. So I just, because that's a very communist thing that the media is doing. Yeah. is just the manipulation of reality, the outright lying, the double standards. And so um, I just wanted to mention that when you mentioned the Joe Biden thing, because I I always want to warn people and not like you, I, you know, I don't, um, it's not, I, I just tell people now, like I'm, I'm totally 100% uh, behind uh, Donald Trump um, being the president for the third time. But the, um, the thing is, uh, I don't consider myself a Republican either. I see that is the best man for the job in 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 the times we're in. Um, yeah. If anything, to to stop the uh, the bleeding, to to put out the fire, no one else can do that right now. No one else has the experience doing that right now. It, there's and anyone who goes into the White House without the experience is going to get eaten alive and they're going to be the next puppet. Trump 
to me is I mean, people say, do you trust him? I don't trust any politician. I don't trust anyone I don't know. But it, I, I do trust their track record. And I do know things are better under Trump. And that's what we need right now is, is that sort of thing. But I, I had a point there before I got on that, that soapbox and I totally lost my train of thought. So I'll, I'll let you move us along. I've had people say that Trump is a narcissist and I actually agree with that, but I actually think that all politicians are narcissists. You yeah, can't like, be president without being a narcissist. You know I what? I, I used to think my, my plumber, you know, actually was a really nice guy. Um, but it didn't matter because he could fix my pipes. I, you know, yeah. my, my mechanic is pretty rough and tumble, pretty stoic guy. When I first met him, I was like, is this guy going to kick my ass or something? And he's, He's a, he's a big guy and a, you know, but he's a great mechanic and we're friends now. But at the time I, I didn't care if I liked him. And I remember my wife's like, Oh, you got to meet him. He's a great guy. And I'm like, I don't care if he's a good guy. I just care if he's a good mechanic. I just care if it's a good president, not if he's a narcissist, not if he, you know, is anything else. His personality doesn't matter to me. And some people say, well, but you need the diplomacy. Do we? Or is diplomacy just something that's been subvert, you know, they, they, we've been subverted by to make ourselves softer in a time when you need men and women of war? Yeah. It kind of reminds me of, uh, I used to like the TV show House MD. And yeah, me too. It, the character was an asshole, but yep. he was like this genius asshole who could solve the problem. And there was that's a, a study, great example, by the way. I'm glad you brought that up. There's a survey that was done of people and they said, you know, who would you want to go to for something mild, like a nice doctor? But who would you want to go to if you actually had a, a real, real issue, like you were facing life and death? You'd want to go to a doctor like that. He could mm-hmm. be a complete jerk, but you just want your problem solved. So you don't care about his bedside manner. You care about his results, you know? Mm-hmm. So, And I got to say, I kind of like Trump because he reminds me of my dad a lot. Like my dad mm-hmm. had that kind of New York affect, kind of... You know, you're always cringing, like, oh, what's he going to say next? My dad was great, and he was great at what he did and, and left my mom in a very nice financial position when he passed. But he was kind of that street tough, a, yeah, a bit, bit rough around the edges. You know, you're at your high school party, and dad shows up. You're like, eh, and then he'd surprise you. And, oh, wow, my dad's really cool. Um, that's how Trump is. And I, I, I saw him recently at CPAC, and I'd seen him speak at Bedminster, and uh, yeah, I was like, yeah, man, this guy is, first of all, at CPAC, it's a big crowd. It's very funny because it, it, I've never listened to such a long speech and just enjoyed it through and through. I mean, it was yeah. just, it, he's just, just rolls with it. Yeah. And then at Bedminster, where it was a more private group of, of a big group, but a big group of donors that we were invited to, it was more serious and it was an amazing speech. And amazing. And even my wife, who, you know, in the past has said she can't stand him, she came out of there and she's, she had to be quite honest with herself. She said, I'm surprised. I did not expect that. I've been so force fed with the media wants me to think of this man. I've never really given him a chance. Yeah. I, and like I said, I have my issues with Donald Trump. I don't consider myself a supporter of him, but uh, I do think that there's a lot of, media portrayals that were not accurate and one of them and i i agree with what you're saying you should always go to the source of information absolutely because like i saw a an article last night or two days ago or something saying that trump was rambling incoherently in some uh in some speech he was doing recently and then they give like a five second clip of something and it's like, you don't have context. And I, th- I think he did misspeak in that five seconds, but it's like, you don't have context. So you should always go to the source. And uh, one of the big examples I have of a misrepresentation, and this was Biden did this misrepresentation and I'm reading this book. Uh, I'm almost done with it. Mistakes were made, but not by me. Great book, a fantastic book uh, when it comes to psychology. But then the end, they Bad focus title. on Trump. <laughs> um, you don't like the title? Mm, um, not really, but it's it's <laughs> yeah. If you say it's a good book, I you know we've talked before. I'm sure I'm gonna end up reading it. Who? What is it about? And who wrote it? Um, it's by Carol Tavris and Elliot Aronson. It's about um, 
they, they go into a lot of really interesting things like the false accusations of uh, preschool uh, sexual assault on children in the 80s at MacArthur's preschool, I think it is. Mm-hmm. And, you know, psychologists led children astray and kind of manipulated them into saying that they were sexually molested when they weren't. And then it goes into like law enforcement and how um, people will justify, like one of the things with uh, interrogators, for instance, that they bring up is interrogators aren't more reliable with telling if people are lying or not but they believe that they're more reliable. So mm. when they interrogate somebody, they start to self-justify as in like, I get well, I don't now. interrogate innocent people. So this person is guilty. And it, oh, does go into, it does go into some interesting stuff with dissonance and stuff like that. But they repeated this thing that's a misrepresentation of something Trump said with the uh, uh, Charlottesville stuff where mm. there were good people on both sides. And that's an incomplete quote because Trump actually said there are good people on both sides. And I'm not talking about the white supremacists and the neo-Nazis. They should be condemned totally. I'm probably misquoting him a little bit, but that's pretty much what he said. Mm -hmm. So they misrepresent that and they say, you know, they just say he said there's good people on both sides. And it's like, and then Biden was saying the same thing up until 2020. And he probably would say the same thing today. So they're that's very the tip much of the iceberg, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I'm I, all I, for. I, so, I the take it back. Context. Now that you've explained the book, I do like the title. I don't think they could choose a different title. I get it. I get it. Yeah. So, I, I will definitely read that. I'm very interested in reading that. Yeah, and I mean the the end is a. Uh, they're they're clearly uh, they have a problem with Trump, and uh, the rest of the book. There is some political stuff in there. They do seem to be more critical of the right than the left. Mm. Uh, I picked up that on that pretty early, but I'm fine with reading books like that. People have their opinions and sure. whatever. But you know, when I think there's a uh, people can tr- can sort of idolize Trump, but people idolize Biden for not being Trump. So it works both ways, in my opinion. Question question on that last thing you said. Yeah. I see that, right, online. Yeah. I see that from some, this idolization of Biden. I see that from some account that's like Squeaker Grips 69 with an animal head avatar. I, I, I'm yet to meet someone on my street, and I'm in Salem. This is, you know, my, you know, I, I own half of a house. It's a multifamily. So I own the bottom floor. They own the top floor. They, they've got a, a LGBTQ flag flying. I'm fine with that. That's, you know, that's their thing. And they're really nice. Um, everyone here is, is at, at a minimum, you know, uh, an old school Democrat or uh, super far left wing, um, almost socialist Democrat they're all a little embarrassed by him. So, and and even from the get go, I've never met anyone in the real world that has any respect for Biden at all. And I'm not doubting you because I know what you've seen. And I'm, we're in a lot of the same spaces. I've seen that where people have him driving away in the car, like the guy can't even drive or walking with like bigger muscles. than we know he has, um, and that's just ridiculous. Like, but I, I, I do wonder if that is, you know, I, I do wonder if that's a yet again another type of covert influence type type uh, propaganda thing. Yeah, I mean, it could be the whole dark Brandon thing. Was like you know that's ridiculous. right out of China, right? The yeah. dark Brandon thing. That's I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, totally. I, I'll I'll pull the reference for you so you have it. But yeah, that's a the the, the CCP made up the dark Brandon thing. They they actually. Market tested several of them and they landed on Dark Brandon and all these morons are like, Dark Brandon, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, first of all, in a dark time such as this, do you really want our hero to be dark anything? Like some sort of under underworld demon is your hero? I mean, yeah. it just it's ridiculous. And plus, I mean, there's nothing tough about Biden. I mean, he's an ass, I think. Like he... he from the bit that I've gathered from him, like seeing him interact with people, 
he talks down to people regularly. Um, I've seen him be very dismissive to people who are bringing genuine concerns to him. I just dismiss him. And I think that's part of, he's been in that elite circle for, you know, 40 plus years, almost 50 years. And he doesn't, he hasn't had to really answer to people. I don't think senators and congressmen often answer to people that they're supposed to represent. Well, and they're, they're very institutionalized. And I mean, he was what he became, he went right to Senator, didn't he? Or did he start as Congressman? I think so. Yeah. I'm not mistaken. Yeah. But it's, it's kind of like, it reminds me and what a lot of people, this is a great thing to talk about because unless you've worked in a very institutional type setting, such as, you know, government, uh, such as the intelligence community or even academia. Okay. You get institutionalized where you kind of lose your connection to the outside world. So, for example, Mm -hmm. when I worked in the intel community in the civilian agencies, I lived in Arlington, Virginia, primarily, and then I moved to uh, Northwest D.C. I always felt like I was, even when I left work, that that was a different world, that all of you were in a fish tank that I was looking into and that I was in the real world. But I never really felt like part of that world. And I've met a lot of these career politicians who have been there so long, they're not really in touch with reality. They don't have a, they all have a sense of impunity in terms of like always having a job, which is probably worse with senators because of their term. But there, you, you do get to that point where there are no consequences for your actions. So for example, in, you know, in the Intel community, if you have a top secret SCI clearance with a full scope polygraph test, you're always going to have a job. I mean, that's just the, they used to call that, you know, you could have no qualifications. If you have that, you will have a, a decent paying full benefits job. We used to call that clearance and a pulse. Um, and you'll have that. Um, and people do get in lulled into that sense of like, nothing can ever happen to me until it does. And you could always see the shock on like Congress people's faces who've been there for a long time or senators who've been, and then all of a sudden, you know, the people at the top change and the direct in front of a hearing, they, yeah. they kind of fumble around like the, you know, the guy that ran the uh, J6 commission when all of a sudden it, the impunity was gone and he was answering questions. He's fumbling all over himself. So when I see Biden, he is like the worst example of that where he's never had to have a real job. He has been kept in that position because he is the ultimate functional puppet. And he always has been. Uh, no one's ever accused Joe Biden of being a, a genius. Um, yeah. And so Biden throughout the time, you know, I was in the, what you might call the Morlock part of the government, the underground, you know, and then I was the Eloys from like the time machine. That would be your politicians. I always consider the Intel community and that sort of thing, the Morlocks, but you know, you're still around policy and everything like that. And, Everyone always knew. I mean, everyone always knew, even before Obama, that Joe Biden, he's kind of a joke. Uh, He was the guy that Hollywood producers would base the corrupt politician on, was Joe Biden. He was the model for that. So when all of a sudden they knocked out Bernie Sanders for Joe Biden, I was like, are you, what? (laughs) Are you people crazy? Like, this guy's an idiot and he's totally on and everyone knew he's owned by the chinese everyone knows that joe biden would take a bribe from anyone anyone knows that he would steal you know the chocolate chip ice cream cone from the kid on the street and everyone knows that corn pop doesn't exist i mean this guy is a liar he's and everyone's always known that but just like good marxists and communists there's a memory problem that is intentionally destroyed and that's why we get so much information is you'd mentioned earlier some things about people forget or people accusing Trump of this and that. That's because people actually forget. I mean, I know people who are rooting for RFK Jr. right now who are sitting there telling me that Donald Trump mandated lockdowns. No, he didn't. He left it to the states or people yeah. saying, well, he brought in the vaccine. I say, well, yeah, of course, he had to start a program. He had to respond to this pandemic because it seems like every single one of his advisors lied to him but 
he did what any president would do. He said, well, let's, let's get a vaccine going, you know? And, um, but then people forget that Pfizer held off announcing that they had a successful vaccine till after the election. But there's a selective yeah. memory that that's formed with people on all sides of the aisle. And I, I think some of it's intentional, but I also think that people forget and people have too many topics to try to focus on. And there's too many devices. There's there's too much information, and I think people just need to get disciplined again, and you know, take that break every forty five minutes, let their mind catch up, um, you know, put the boxes back on the shelf, and then go back in and research what you want. But I'll mention things that were pretty common knowledge to the let's say people looking into the origins of COVID and stuff like that. Yeah. And I'll say that to my friends who we had long discussions about this. And I'll say, well, do you remember Peter Dajic or the Eco Health Alliance or, um, you know, Xi Jing Li? And they're like, who? Wait a minute. Who's that again? You know, and, and I'm seeing that a lot more. I don't know if you're seeing something like that as well, but I, I do believe it's intentional. Uh, Joe Biden was, this was not the first time he ran for president. He ran in the mm -hmm. late 80s and he was laughed out of the race for plagiarizing, um, blatantly plagiarizing a UK politician's speech. And there's videos of Joe Biden saying he was in the top of his law class. And yeah. uh, I think he, I think it was a law wasn't class, he, but what, top what, of his he class, right he was next in the to bomb Mandela hat. as well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he is a serial liar. And I know some people claim that Trump is too. And I do think Trump can be full of crap sometimes, but I haven't found anything you know. he's lied about though. Remember that? That was the thing. He lies. What's he lie about? I, well, I don't know I anything he's lied about. Well, Trump is, he will kind of like wiggle out. Like he'll say things like, all right. One of the things that I can think of is, and, and I actually would give him a pass on this because I think it was absurd for a reporter to push on this. But when uh, Trump did a joint, uh, press thing with uh, Putin one time and somebody pushed Trump right in front of Putin, Putin of like, do you believe our intelligence that Russia interfered with the election? And he said, I have no reason to believe that Russia interfered with the election or I, I you know, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And then he kind of backtracked later. And I would actually kind of give him a pass on that because it was an absurd thing to ask. Like you don't ask somebody right in front of the guy who did it. Like, do you believe that mm -hmm. this guy did it? And it's like, right. do you want to start a war right now? You make like, a good point. So no. yeah, I, I don't, I think it was an inappropriate question to ask. But and keep time. in mind too, like if, when, when was that asked? What, what year was that? Do you roughly? Uh, I'm not sure. It would probably be 2017, 16. Yeah. I mean, keep, be in, first years. keep in mind, you've got people forget this too. Like, and, you know, neither one of us are, are, are right out of college and just entering the workforce. So you, you, you can relate to this. I'm slightly older yeah. than you, but not that much. But um, people are busy. And as busy yeah. as we are, the president, he's working 20, well, not this one, but typically 18 hours a day at a minimum. And they can't know everything. And remember, the president from the Intel community only sees for the most part, unless he wants to otherwise the president's daily brief for the PDB, mm. which is controlled by the now controlled by the DNI or the director of national intelligence, which is a very political position. Mm. So that DNI is deciding what that president sees. And the president's so busy, just like when he, you know, Fauci has been around for a long time. You've got the world that you're kind of responsible for. Hey, do we got a plan for this virus? Yes, we do. Great. You know, when I was in, um, you know, the military, I'd, I'd give my intel briefing. It wasn't like my commander was checking my sources. Yeah. He's trusting his advisors. And, and who would have thought that, it, and it's this almost, you know, there's almost evidence to this point across the board. Who would have thought that almost every single advisor was working against the president? Because that's what it seems like. And when I, um, 
when I when I see something like that, it it also makes me think like, well, wait a minute. We know that Russia was a hoax. That's been proven. So he may have never seen any of the Russia intelligence because they hadn't sprung it on on him yet. You know, who knows? I mean, it sounds to me like not to chill for Trump or make excuses, um, but, uh, you know, being in just our normal lives with, with you know, uh, content producers, creators and, and journalism and everything. And, and, you know, now that, you know, I've got two kids, you know, I've got an adult child and a, 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 a tween, as they say. Man, the days go by fast, the older you get. Yeah. So can you imagine yeah. 21 hours a day? And then you're right. And I think you're also correct there. You're hit with that question of like, hey, is do you think this guy's an asshole? Like you said at the country club, Mr. President. I never said that like that, you idiot. You yeah. know, that sort of yeah. stuff. I, I, I see your point. And it could be any of those things. But, you know, I just <laughs> I just think that people we were talking about this earlier. Everyone wants George Washington. Everyone wants Abraham Lincoln. Everyone wants, uh, you know, uh, Reagan. And yeah. people forget. I mean, America is a wonderful country. I love my country. Um, and I, I, I will die for my country. But it, you, need a, you need a business mind to run this country, which is a capitalist based on business country in terms of our growth and, and why we're so powerful. I, yes, inspiration is nice, but you know what? There's plenty of sources of inspiration. Um, I want someone who's going to get it done. And I like how transactional he is. I like that he can say, hey, you know what? You know, Russia, Putin, he's done some things over here. But if we get him to do this kind of trade with us, he won't go over there. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, I think that was a, a bit, I don't want to say naive because I'm sure he must have known. But I mean, China was already in multiple military treaties with Russia for many, many, many years. So they are kind of indentured to China as I see it. But yeah, I mean, back to your point, it's like I see that and people nitpicking. It's like, God, you know, I just wish everyone could walk in those shoes for one day. They wouldn't want that job. Not that I have any experience or walk in anyone's shoes. When you have, when people have time to sit all day and do nothing because uh, they're getting an unemployment check or, you know, they don't have to work for whatever reason, um, or their job is to point out all the faults of the president. Um, that's really easy, but can you imagine having kids, having a wife, uh, having domestic issues, having, you know, foreign issues, having everyone that wants to kill you. And then on top of that, having everyone that wants to kill you in your own office. And, oh, by the way, your office is also bugged by the lady that wanted to be president. I mean, yeah. talk about having a million balls in the air. So I, I don't, I would never want that job. So. I'm so impressed that this guy not only kind of survived, but is actually just taking on every battle and getting stronger as he goes. I mean, it's amazing what's happened. Um, I, I got to say, like, even if I wasn't voting for him, I would have to step back and say, what a warrior. I mean, holy cow, mm -hmm. the stuff they've thrown at this guy. And it's almost like it makes him stronger. And I get it. If he doesn't stop fighting, they will destroy him. If he said tomorrow, I'm done. I'm not going to run for president. You don't got to worry anymore about the populist movement or the nationalist movement. They would still destroy him at this point because they can't not destroy him. It's too much of a threat because, as you know, with, with Marxists and communists, they have to destroy every enemy and every potential enemy. Yeah, By the I way, think cut me off any time I'm Irish and we tend to oh. run on. So I, I won't <laughs> think you're rude. I. Uh I mean, everyone get, makes mistakes. Everyone says the wrong thing. I, I would imagine if, if I were to go back in any one, every one of my interviews that I've done, I've said something incorrect and we can't know everything. We're just, we're not omnipotent. We just aren't. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I do have a question as it relates to Biden and a little bit of Trump because Trump was impeached for a phone call that he had with uh, Zelensky. Mm. And 
uh, that phone call, ultimately, like Trump was asking about what was going on there with the whole Burisma thing. And I recently had a friend, uh, he's progressive, and he reached out to me and he said, what do you think of this whole Smirnov thing? And uh, Smirnov is a guy Mm -hmm. that was recently uh, charged, I guess, with being a Russian agent or a foreign agent or something. And I don't know all the details of this, but my friend made the argument that uh, this means that the Republicans in Congress that are pushing for impeachment of Joe Biden are um, either incompetent or Russian assets and that the he was essentially making an argument that the impeachment inquiry should stop and i was actually okay with trump being looked into when people were saying that he could be a russian agent i said well look into it you know i i don't believe i believe politicians should be held to a higher standard period right and i pushed back on him but i said well If there's Russian disinformation involved in the impeachment inquiry of Joe Biden, then I believe that should come to light. But just because that's the narrative, and that's currently what it is, it's a narrative that it's Russian disinformation. No one's been found guilty of providing Russian disinformation. Even even people can be charged for something, and that charge could be totally fake Mm -hmm. or, or could be blown up over time. And uh, I pushed back and I said, well, have you ever heard of the Steele dossier? (laughs) Because that was Russian disinformation, as Mm -hmm. far as I can tell. And he said, well, I think that, I think there's things in the Steele dossier that were true. I said, well, that's how disinformation works. You take little bits of truth and you stretch it to make it into something fake, but some, some semblance of truth in there so that you're like, Oh, well, this, this little thing happened. So this bigger thing must have happened too. And Mm -hmm. I believe that's how disinformation is most effective. Am I right in that? It's yes, that, but also repetition and redundancy. Mm -hmm. It's just keep repeating the lie and the lie becomes reality. Um, and God, I'd love to talk to your friend and, 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 and help him or her out. Um, it's also the biggest problem with the steel dossier from the get-go. It's single sourced intelligence. Yeah. It's all hearsay. Like, and there's value to that. We have human t- or human intelligence sources, but I can't ima- I can't imagine going to any client or any former military commander or any former agency director and say, okay. I got the smoking gun. Here we go. We got this guy, Chris Steele, who speaks Russian. He's actually from the UK. He's not Russian, but he said that Trump was pissing out the window onto hookers. Okay, let's roll with that. I can't imagine doing that, but we have a history of doing it in this country. Do you ever hear hear of a guy named Curveball? I don't think so. The Germans gave us an intelligence asset and human intelligence asset prior to the invasion of Iraq. His code name was actually Curveball. He was the guy that uh, said there were missile manufacturing mm-hmm. and all that. And the Germans even said to the Bush administration, we don't trust this guy. Probably why they named him Curveball. Because you have these like pseudos or crypts. That way you could put his name in a cable or something. And people, if it leaks, they won't really know who that is. But they did. They choose the name and they chose Curveball for whatever reason. So... We, we, we invaded a whole country on, on a single source of intelligence, and we've seen the result. And so yeah. when everyone was beating that drum of like, oh, the, the Steele dossier and all this, it's like, it's a single source of intelligence. That is Intel 101. Hell, that is um, best practices in first-year college research 101. You would never write a term paper and just put for your footnote, some guy told me. Because <laughs> yeah. that's really what it was. Yeah. And so that just blew. But what you're right, though, what they do is they, they there's this distraction that happens. There's the steel dossier, right? And then people, if like me, they don't want people like me or you looking at that. So we start looking into it and then they're like, oh my God, he's trying to suppress the FBI agent's wife or something. 
Donald Trump is. And then you're like, Oh, okay. I'll get back to this. And you go over here and then they, then like, Oh my God, he's, he's got his, remember this. He's, he's not going to let the, the, the nuclear codes go when he leaves the presidency. And it's like, what? Wait, time out, slow down. But you forget you're over here looking into the validity of this thing. That is the tree that the poisonous fruit came from yeah. or who hired them or who he worked for. Uh, the people I feel the worst about is Fusion GPS. I think they're the straw man in this whole thing. Um, hmm. They, I, I know Glenn Simpson. Um, it's DC is a small place. I've, you know, all our kids kind of went to the same elementary schools and stuff. His kids were older, but yeah, he was a Wall Street journalist. He's not like a a Russian asset, and he ran an opposition research company. I think he still does Fusion GPS. GPS. Those are just his initials. But I've seen their research methods, and, is, and, and he testified to these on, on the Hill. He testified at the Feinstein hearings. Uh, he brought his lawyer with him, and he laid out their whole process. And it's the way anyone would do opposition research. Christopher Steele was just part of uh, his source list. It's a hmm. primary source, or actually technically secondary. But, you, you know, you got – that's also the intel world, too, that people forget, like, you can't prove that anything on my resume is real or fake yeah. unless you have access to the agencies I worked at or the clearance database. You, I can, that's what makes it difficult. So if you're hiring people and they say, I've done this, this, and this, I mean, how do you know they're valid? Now, granted, Christopher Steele did have a decent resume, but you, you know, you're only as good as your last job. And so you just don't know with Intel assets, you just assume uh, when you recruit an asset that they will be working for someone else. That is just the hard truth of it. So hmm. every single, like when I had assets and, and Christopher Steele was a primary asset of Fusion GPS, who was then hired by Perkins Coie to produce this opposition report on Trump. It's my belief and partial knowledge that Steele kind of double dipped where he's getting paid by Fusion GPS to produce, to go get intel. That's his job. Go fishing, go hunting, go get intel, bring it back. We'll put it in the report. And that's how it works. All your sources come in, you collect, you collect, you collect, then you triage, then you analyze, then you sort, and then you create a finished intelligence product or an opposition research paper. I think Steele gave his report, his field report, which is all it was to Fusion GPS. They started doing their work and checking his sources and checking his stuff. I think Steele turned around and was either coerced into or just decided to give it to directly to Perkins Coie behind Fusion GPS's back and get himself a little extra money, which wouldn't be beyond the pale for Intel guys. It happens all the time. And then they ran with the juicy one rather than the responsible one. So, and if you really... I would even say to anyone, I mean, if you really look at Fusion GPS and really look at Fusion GPS, they did the same kind of work any oppo research firm would do. They just happened to get in with the wrong law firm and the wrong asset, in my opinion. Hmm. When, it, when it comes to Biden and the impeachment inquiry, my friend, I pushed back and said, listen, Saying it's all Russian disinformation now, and I, I actually talked to my friend about this very idea mm. of narrative being stronger than truth often in politics, mm -hmm. because I believe that to be very true, sure. that most people adopt a narrative rather than adopt the truth. And I told him, I said, listen, if you're saying that this is Russian disinformation, so we should look into excluding potential Russian disinformation from the inquiry, I would say, fine. But if you're saying, hey, because this is Russian inf disinformation and Jamie Raskin is now using his that as a narrative to push for the dismissal of the entire inquiry, I reject that, especially coming from somebody who relied on Russian disinformation to pursue an impeachment when, it, when the shoe was on the other foot. Mm -hmm. And... I just I had a problem with this because I'm like, if if we're talking about dismissing this inquiry, 
I'm not on board with that because even though I'm I'm pretty middle when it comes to politics, I look at what happened with Burisma and I'm like, okay, Hunter Biden got paid a million dollars a year without any experience while his dad was vice president and we're not supposed to look at that. And then Hunter Biden admitted in an interview that he took a like a 50,000 diamond from a Chinese oligarch, I believe right, it was, right. and supposedly put it in a locker never to see it again. I'm like, no, that doesn't, that doesn't fly with me. That doesn't make no, sense yeah. why that shouldn't be looked <laughs> into. So it's like a, it's like a, you know, it's almost like the Fannie Willis trial that just, I think wrapped up as a, it's like a mini version of the Hunter Biden one. Like, oh, she paid me cash. She's carrying around 8,000 cash on a date. Okay. And then they just double down. But, you know, on that Biden thing, it's really, I, I always, I always think about this. It's like, the dude's a crackhead. I mean, he's a drug addict. I've had drug addicts in my family. Can you imagine? It's a, it's a nightmare of epic proportions to think of a crack addict with access to foreign policy uh, mm-hmm. via his father. Okay. And the leverage that people can hold over him. I mean, I couldn't imagine the jubilation of our foreign adversaries, Intel apparatus. When I could see that, I could see that, uh, Ukrainian or even Chinese field officer coming in and saying, all right, guys, guess what I got? What do you got? You, oh, you recruited, you recruited a principal. That's good. Oh, you recruited a, ma- a mayor. Yeah. Guess, guess what? I, I got Joe Biden's son. And they were going to like, he was like the, that dude was a superstar, whoever he was. And they'd be like, nah, you don't have him. No, no, he's over in a hotel. I hooked him up with about four 14 year olds and it's all on tape. And he's cracked out of his mind. We're going to own him forever. You know, like that, that's like an Intel officer's dream to have that yeah. person. And, uh, when I see the, you know, the, I wanted to mention something too that no one ever questions. Have you ever noticed? No one ever says they'll, they'll make these statements like Russian disinformation. Okay. And the common one is Russian disinformation about. Russia, you know, regarding Russia interfering in our campaigns. Now, if you really unpack that, why would the Russians spread disinformation that incriminates them? Yeah. I mean, it, they still have to trade. They still have to not get bombed by us. I mean, why would they spread disinformation that makes them look worse um, or makes yeah. it look like their plan didn't work? Because Trump's not in office, um, you know, those. And so I don't think enough people really are thinking critically these days as they should. And you, you mentioned uh, reading um, Desmond Matthias. I always, you know, I always flip his name around and I met him recently, too. And I feel bad for that. But there is this rewriting of people's like there seems to be a, a bludgeoning of people's ability to to think critically. Just about like common sense things and uh, like Russian disinformation Um, or the fact that, you know, no one questions the fact that the WTO hasn't changed China's status from developing country to developed country to this day. Or there's so many illegal aliens pouring through, but you must be a Trumper if you say that. Like, People need to really step out of the fray. And I, I recommend to everyone... Undocumented, right? Undocumented. No, the, the official name, actually, according to the Supreme Court, is illegal aliens. Oh, I know. I'm just... I'm referencing... Oh, uh, were you being funny? <laughs> Joe Biden Joe Biden called... Uh, <laughs> Sorry. I mean, you covered the uh, State of the Union address. Mm-hmm. And Joe Biden actually called... He called Lake and Riley, Lincoln Riley, and then said uh, Lincoln was killed by an illegal... Then in a later interview, he was asked about that, and he actually backtracked and called, he said, undocumented, un- undocumented. And it's like, you're not going to apologize for getting her name wrong, but you're going to apologize for yeah. uh, calling an, a murderer an illegal? Totally. That's kind of crazy to me. You know, and, and this is just, I got to say this, man. It's like, uh, you know... Um, I was really shocked when RFK Jr. said, I've met RFK Jr. He's a super nice guy. We've been at a few of his events and, you know, he's 
him and my wife have been on interviews. So, you know, I, I get to hang out with him for a little while, person to person, but really like him. But um, I, I was really a little shocked and a little concerned when he put out a tweet recently that said, you know, uh, I'm paraphrasing, like, uh, despite all this, he's Joe, I, I've met him. Joe Biden's actually a nice guy. I'm like, mm-hmm. what? Like, no, he's not. <laughs> he is not a nice guy. He's a, I mean, he, he's, he's maybe one of the worst human beings I've ever met. I actually think Hunter is a nicer guy than his father is. Um, this is like a mean person. This is a, uh, narcissist uh with personality disorder and an alcoholic and most likely based on his own statements a racist like mm. this is not a good person i was a little shocked when i you know i don't know if that's just being diplomatic so you can try to win the presidency but i was shocked when when people said that because one thing i know about bad people and communists and complete a-holes so you don't have to edit um is you can't give them an inch. You can't say, yeah, buts with them. You can't say, well, yeah, he, you know, killed my sister and burnt down my home, but he is a big brother and he does help a lot of people out. No, you can't give them an inch. They're right. bad and they have to, you know, they, they shouldn't be influencing any part of your life. And when, when anyone says that, something like that, it really, really does give me pause. I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying, it it makes me question one's judgment or the direction one is planning on going, you know, and, and like right now with this current democratic party, if that direction one wants to go is to reach across the aisle and try to bring us all together, you're not living on this planet. Like this current democratic party needs to be destroyed. All And by that, I mean, all of these people currently in and the rhinos that, that allow them to get away with what they get away with, they they need to be out of office. I mean, we need mm. spring cleaning. I do believe that we need Democrats and Republicans in this world. I, I think yeah. they give us one gives us a, a lot of creative ideas and thinks about things, where the other one is more lockstep in terms of organization, management, and you know uh, the type of leadership or management that you need. And working together, I think that's a, a wonderfully harmonious thing. But we need to find our, we, we need kind of need to clean it all out and reestablish those checks and balances. And they need to start policing each other much more than they ever did. And we got to get rid of, I think you were on that space. I, I agree with single issue voting or single issue bills. And there's got to be a way to ban lobbyists from DC. They got to go. Yeah. I'm happy you said that you see a place for both parties because I, I firmly believe that the right and left need each other because without one or the other, without one of them, you just go into totalitarianism. Look at nine um, eleven, no man. What. I mean, yeah, nine eleven. Like I was a kid. Sorry to cut you off, but just um, the Republicans, like people were just gladly saying, "I'm I'm sorry," but like the, and I used to get in fights with my own family on this, but like the Republicans were like, "Yeah, take our rights, go get them, go get the bad guys." I'm like. Well, yeah. time out. My wife wrote a book about it called The End of America, but it applies to everyone. You have that. And it was the same thing. House, Congress, presidency, that kind of power corrupts. And they had, they were asking for the same things during that time that people were asking for during COVID, like spy on your neighbors. Cause let's face it. That's what they were asking people to do. Okay, that's why people yeah. are so bold about yelling at you on the street about your mask. Well, they were doing that in 9-11. They were telling the doorman in New York, hey, you see something, say something. And then that became the slogan. And that's all good. I mean, look, you, you should see something. You should say something. You know, if someone's getting mugged on the street, you should call the police or intervene. But it became, it started this drumbeat of like cessation of rights for a greater good which yeah. just just scares the hell out of me. But we saw it, and I, that's why I say that about both parties. They should keep each other in check, okay? And, that, and that's the thing, because, yeah. can you, I mean, if you have all Republicans, we've seen the result of that. That wasn't great, okay? When you have all Democrats in charge in the power positions, that also, I mean, to be quite honest, that has been a, an epic nightmare 
worse than I ever imagined. But it could have been either party. It just depends on the time and the technology, in my opinion. Yeah, and I worry about that pendulum swinging both ways. Like, yeah. I'm I'm a bit more worried about the Democrat Party than the Republican Me Party too. right now. Absolutely, but in I mean I I look at what George W. Bush did, and I I'm like, wow, that was the biggest infringement on our rights up until COVID. Um, yeah, that I had seen in my lifetime. The Patriot Act was an absolute disaster, and I I wasn't in the public arena at that point, but I remember toward my friends on Facebook, mm-hmm. I wrote this long piece, uh, this little thing. And I said, listen, I know things are scary right now, but you have to remember history. I remember what happened after nine 11 and all the fear of everything going on. We Absolutely. lost track of it and we let our rights get rights get stripped away. And we don't want that to happen again. And and that's exactly what we let happen. And yeah. Well, and it, you know, it brings up like you're, you're absolutely couldn't 100% correct. Couldn't agree with you more on everything. And you're right. People only see, and this could explain a lot of, and I think this does explain a lot of, you know, you hear the people asking these days, like, how can they go along with this? Well, I'm sure the Dixie chicks back there after nine 11, who just got horribly crucified for yeah, speaking out yeah. against uh, the war, the Iraq war, crucified. Um, and, you know, I'm sure they were saying, how can they go along with this? And it's like, anytime you get caught up in group thinking or anytime you make decisions in an emotional state, things are going to go wrong. And then when you have a mass movement of people, all emotional, and 9-11 was an acutely, nationally, horribly emotional thing for all of us. And it, you're right, it affected our lives, it affected travel, nothing's yeah. been the same since. Yeah. Um, it created an entire industry. I mean, the Intel community swelled. And and that's when contractors really grabbed power, like the SASC's Booz Allen's. It became super powerful during, um, and they remain powerful during that time. It changed everything, but it goes back to that point of like, how can they do this? How can they do this? Well, I think it's important that we, like you said, keep educating ourselves, but educate ourselves in the sense of recognizing the signs of mass indoctrination or as uh, Matthias Desmond would say, um, yeah. recognize that indoctrination or, or, you know, as my wife would say in the end of America, recognize those 10 steps. I mean, that was called a warning, you know, to a patriot. I'm going to get it wrong, but, um, you know, people need to read, people need to read like my son. I took him to the bookstore. He's 12 and, you know, he picks out this, I love that book. It's my grandfather book. loved that book. I read that like two years ago. My grandfather who fought in World War II, yep. I found out that was one of his favorite books, The Rise and Fall of the Third so Reich. But he, you know, he picks that up and he, you know, and um, I'm actually in his room right now. So this is my makeshift studio. But then I'm happy to see that on his desk. Mm. He's 12. Yeah. Because he's yeah. listened and we forced it on him too, Naomi and I, um, to listen. And like this will affect you all. Okay, this will affect you. This is not Desert Storm or Desert Shield where dad's going to fly out or your uncle's going to fly out to go fight a war, come back, and we're, we're it's here. The war is here now. Yeah. And so I'm glad to see that. But people have to recognize and educate themselves on the signs. And the minute this pandemic started, I was pretty impressed. I mean, I, I honestly, I thought she was crazy, but my my wife was like, they're never going to let us out. That's the first thing she yeah. said. Like early on. And I said, that's ridiculous. Yeah, of course they are. You know, this is just, they don't know what's going on. So, and I, I put yeah. on a mask. I, I just figured it was a Chinese attack. So I was going to wear a mask. I was, I'll wear whatever. Um, but then I realized two months in, like, she's right. Or like when all the masks yeah. came off, they tried to put them back on. And then it expanded into race and it expanded into Ukraine and all this stuff. Um, I was like, she's right. Like this has been a major shift, but she saw it coming because she studied it. And lots of people, you know, uh, have studied it and they saw it coming. I was glad when I was in the Bronx that I saw the minute Times square 
closed down, I started seeing a bunch of cop cars over there in Mont Haven kind of gathering around like the exits. And at that point there, I said to Naomi, I said, let's get out of here. Let's go to the country. You know, let's get yeah. out. And uh, we saw the signs. Why do we have a place in the country? Because she was in 9-11. She was at the we- in the West Village and she re- saw the lockdowns then in the city. And she needed a, she decided I need to have a place to escape to. So she bought a very humble kind of cottage. We call it Liberty Lair now, but that's a direct practical application of recognizing the signs of totalitarianism or a cessation of rights because it can kill you. It can kill you. You could be locked in the Bronx and getting mugged or locked in, or God forbid, if you're in China where they welded people in their homes. Yeah, so that was insane. Recognizing the signs, I think, is just survival for most people. And I, I, f- I feel bad for them, but I just I will only help the people onto a boat that want to be helped. I will not help the drowning man who fights me. And people are, I think, the, the good thing about, in my opinion, I do believe the election was stolen. That's my opinion. Um, but I think all that's happened since 2020 has been i think we're gonna look back on this and 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 if it goes well and people recognize what this is and they they react appropriately this was a wake-up call for real americans to realize how much power certain people have grabbed how much power hhs for instance has over our government how much of a threat china is uh how much of a threat corruption in our political system as like these were things we'd see on movies i think now it woke so many people up i do believe if donald trump had gotten in without any issues i think i think we'd be in real trouble going into 2024 i think we'd be in real trouble because there wouldn't be all these movements there wouldn't be um you know the strength of um you know the moms movements and all this activism that i've never seen on on conservative circles um Hmm. people are people are really awake there wouldn't be a rumble for instance there'd just be more censorship there wouldn't be a getter there'd be more censorship there wouldn't be a dan bongino show or steve bannon's war room there would just be the normal thing and it's because of people like bannon and you know my wife and, and and anyone big or small who's out there saying hey watch out for this that when we had this catastrophe that we are still in the middle of people had a place to go. Okay. And they had a place to go. And I think his generation, and I, I, I've seen this with all his friends and we're outside Boston. So it's not exactly, you know, a a bastion of a conservative sentiment around here, but these kids, his age, like 10 to like 18, almost they get it. Like I'm noticing that. And that's across demographics. Mm -hmm. That's from Brooklyn uh, to Boston, to rural New York, out to California, because we travel a lot. That group gets it. And that's the group that every politician should be focused on. Because that group gets it. They see the danger. They see the danger of their older sisters and brothers, you know, from like 20 years old to about 35. They see the dangers. They don't want that. It's scary to them. It was scary to these kids to see the violence of BLM and so much more. It is terrifying to them. And they also see the dangers of things like TikTok and too many devices and the kids that discover it and the kids that break free. Like my son has stayed free of that. Um, and all his friends have, but he told me something really significant. He, I said, why do you like the friends you like? And why do you? you think you guys all get along because none of them really play many video games and stuff anymore. They did, but they don't. Yeah. He said, I don't know. And he, he said, you know, there's this guy and this guy and this guy, and, you know, we're all on the football team. Then there's this guy and this guy and this guy, and we do a lot of hiking and fishing and sailing. And then there's this guy and this guy. And, th- and then I realized, Oh, they're all doing stuff outdoors. They're not always mm-hmm. in front of their screens. And that's the thing that sets yeah. them apart. So with COVID, I love hearing that about your son because it, I, he's a cool kid. So is my daughter. I don't have kid. I don't have kids myself, but I, I believe that children are extremely important and they need to be both protected from certain things and exposed to the right things mm-hmm. so that they can, uh, they can face the right challenges and, uh, and develop critical thinking. I, when I was a kid, I was, uh, or throughout my entire life, I was always the, 
I was kind of a troublemaker when I was uh, younger. I went to a private Catholic school Wait, in grade school. What and were you doing? I love the story already. I was a troublemaker I just, and I went to a private Catholic school. I got to hear this. <laughs> I just never listened. I just always had a problem with authority. Mm. And it was, I, I got grounded a lot by my parents. Uh, they didn't know how to deal with me. Mm. And it, it's kind of funny when I look back on it because one, I, I have, I think they, uh, the schools missed out on being able to let me read. Like, give me a book when you send me out in the hall out of class. Like, let oh, me yeah, read. Yeah. Um, but I think it helped prepare me for life later on because I saw a lot of people around me. And I will say this, at the start of COVID, I was a little bit of ahead of the curve when it came to spotting what was going on. I, I, uh, I was listening to people talk and I, I saw that there was a virus coming. I was working for uh, Cox Automotive at the time. I eventually got fired for refusing the vaccine. Yeah, you mentioned that. they that. tried to force on everyone. Yeah. And uh, at, I actually was telling my uh, manager, who she was remote, I said, there's a virus coming. There's a pandemic that's about to start. I don't know if I'm going to be coming into the office that much longer. So I stopped going into the office several weeks before and they told everyone to go home. I was wearing a mask. I was I was wiping down food that we bought from the grocery store with, uh, you know, disinfectant wipes. I didn't know what we were dealing with. Right. I, I was warning. People. I was doing the same thing, man. I was warning people because you can't trust China. You can't trust mm-hmm. what information is coming out there. All I knew is we we had a pandemic on our hands. Right. And I was telling people, I don't know how what percentage of lethality this has. It could be 5%. It could be more. It could be less. But, I mean, 5% is a lot of people if, if it kills that many people. Right. And so I was, a, I was extremely paranoid at first. And then as the data started coming in, I was like, this is actually pretty mild. This is not that bad. Oh, nice. Um and masks, I mean, cloth masks, just by, I mean, you can just think about it and how absurd it is to think that a cloth, cloth mask is going to save anybody's life. It's just absurd. Mm. And 95 masks might do a little bit, but you have to be very specific with how you wear them. You have to be clean shaven. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they have to be the right N95 masks. Good on you for mentioning that. that, the clean shaven thing. I only thought military yeah. people knew that. But yes, you're absolutely yeah. right. Because you can't get a seal unless you're clean shaven. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, and I mean, like if you're, if you're wearing a mask, I wear glasses a lot of the mm-hmm. time. If you're wearing a mask and you're breathing and your glasses are fogging up, air is obviously getting out of the mask and onto your glasses, right, right. which means a virus would be getting out too. Mm-hmm. The best mask, I think, I mean, I explained from a physical perspective, like a mask might prevent the flow of air. It might slow the flow of air a little bit down. So it might stop the air from spreading too far in your immediate vicinity. Well, isn't the point of this to stop keep it. doctors from spitting in your wounds while they're working? Yeah, yeah. 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 It's so that like, they don't have spit coming out right. and like, I want a doctor or a dentist wearing a mask when they're working on Absolutely. me, but I, I don't, if they have a cold, I'm going to get the cold, you know, we're in close proximity. It's not stopping anything exactly. like that. And they know that. They, they, they know but that. I say all that just to say, as the data came in, it became very obvious that what I was worried about wasn't as big of a concern. And then I got really concerned, not by the virus, but by the reaction of everyone else around me. I said, okay, the data is showing that this isn't as big of a deal. The data is showing that children are at almost zero risk from this virus. Yet we're talking about forcing children to, uh, wear masks, take the vaccine, all this stuff. And, right. and the, the, it, the goal kept shifting. And I was very concerned with that because it just, it didn't make sense. Like, especially, I, I mean, I have a, an associate's degree in science mm-hmm. and I was going to get a bachelor's degree, never finished it. But I actually like science for what it is, yeah. a tool. And uh, you update your view based on the information that comes in. But it it was like everyone got stuck in that first week or two of the pandemic. And then 
there's people to this day that they can't admit that the vaccine wasn't that I don't, I don't care what people believe as far as like if they don't have to be in any extreme view of the vaccine, mm. but it was clear that we were lied to. They never tested on whether it prevented transmission. Mm -hmm. And I was telling people this from the beginning, like when you, even if the, the study is completely genuine and forthright, you cannot study more than one or two variables in a study mm -hmm. at any given time, because there, the more variables, the less you can actually tell what what's happening. Because if you have 10 variables, it's like, well, these variables are changing. Yeah. You don't know like what is the cause of them. So you have to define, well, what is safe? What is effective? And how are you studying those parameters? And then if if that's what's being studied, you can't say, well, you it they're not studying transmission. They're not studying a ton of other things. They're only testing these like very small variables. And obviously we know financial interests being involved too, that, that affects yeah. it pretty heavily. So, but I'll say this, when you were, um, you know, you mentioned you, you were trying to explain to people, um, or trying to explain to your friend and, and that's, I worked in without, I mean, I, I can't go into the details of, but I worked in something around mass psychology and, and propaganda for a long time and to influence populations. And I see this frustration, and I've had this frustration. I see it all the time, um, where people like you, you know, uh, high IQ individuals, um, well studied, you know, myself included, trying to explain to people common sense. But you're, yeah. I think what a lot of people, maybe not you, but what a lot of people don't know or overlook is the fact that. The moment, there's a moment in the indoctrination process with covert influence and propaganda. The goal of covert influence is to pretty much break and reformat the brain into something that can receive erroneous or truthful, but is more receptive to the broadcast that is propaganda. And yeah. the point at which the brain of the, the, um, you know, the, the masses, in my opinion, broke. I think that the real, the real point that I can remember that breaking, um, which meant the covert influence campaign called vaccine confidence activities was successful was when the, uh, HHS, uh, or whoever subcomponent said this, that protests and black lives matter were also a public health emergency. Therefore they were allowed to gather, in large crowds on the street. Wow. And at that point there, I was watching and having worked in that type of field, I was thinking to myself, logically, um, like, uh, they went too far. This is going to kill their campaign. This is because I, I could tell right away from the get go, like I, was, I told Naomi, I said, I'm pretty sure this is a program program that, uh, I, I may have even participated in creating this multi-level reality program of comedians, music, rhythm, graffiti, you name it, just to change people's reality, their perception of the world. And yeah. when, so I started looking at it from a uh, kind of, you know, the, the way a dad might look at a, you know, a son who's trying to pick up a girl for the first time, like, oh, they, oh no, you're screwing it up. Or, the, you know, the way I looked at my stepson when he, you know, in my opinion, mistakenly let a guy uh, with a ponytail and a guitar come to his party. You know, if if you're the dude and you want to get that girl, you don't let sensitive ponytail in with his guitar because he's he's <laughs> that you can't compete. No one can compete with that unless you also have a guitar and can play it. So it, I was kind of looking at when I saw the the, the that that health emergency thing. I, I thought to myself, ah, oh, they screwed it up. Okay, we're good now. Like this is just going to break it. This is going to wake people up and it didn't. But then I forgot about one thing, the difference between some of the work I was doing and the pretty much the same kind of approach. The big difference was uh, isolation. And mm -hmm. 
that was what I had overlooked. And, and in hindsight, I can't say in foresight because I didn't think of this. I should have paid more attention to things like statements like broadband is a right that everyone deserves. What? <laughs> like broadband mm -hmm. is a right? Personally, I wish I'd never met broadband. I'd rather be, you know, uh, with a book um, at this point. But what that was, it's forcing everyone in front of that window and that isolation. And then I, I wish I'd even thought to look it up as well. And it was actually my friend up in, he's in, he's actually up in Canada. And I, I think he's a cyber guy with their government. He actually said from the very beginning, he said, this is one of the biggest data hacks ever. And he also exposed zoom having the Chinese communist servers. And I, I wish I'd looked, but I should have paid more attention. And quite honestly, I have clients. I get a day job. I didn't see a pandemic coming. I didn't. And, um, yeah. Like Zoom went public a couple months before the pandemic. And then all of a sudden there's these curricula and programs online already deployed to the school. And I won't ever forget to look for that stuff again, I guess is the point I'm making. But back to the indoctrination program, when you see it and you see that emergency, then you realize, okay, okay, this is the, the this you're you're trying to explain that was my point you were trying to explain in very logical uh detail with great arc really trying to articulate very um clear points but have you ever noticed there's that blank stare they give you back it's because they're indoctrinated and once someone's indoctrinated the only way you can even have a a hope to break through that indoctrinated brain is by using the same frequency back at them. So by that, I mean mm -hmm. in signals intelligence where I started, if you have a frequency and you want to keep the enemy, you intercept the enemy frequency, you want to disrupt that frequency, you have to hit it with the same frequency. You can't mm -hmm. hit like a higher frequency because it's going to go right over it. So when you're explaining to the indoctrinated mind, common sense things that you and I can talk about and they make sense to us and we'll come to an agreement. The indoctrinated brains down here, you're way up here. They, they don't even hear you because they're indoctrinated. Yeah. And these are smart people. Education level has nothing to do with it. Um, yeah. And the only way you can fight that is to do exactly what they did in verse redundancy repetition. So if there is a next pandemic, I'm sure they they want one, the bad guys. But if there is one, or we ever find ourselves here again, we read our books, we say, okay, you give me a call and you're like, hey, man, I think this is going to happen. We collaborate. We start making our groups, our defense. The one thing that we have to encourage people to do is if people start saying, stay safe, stay inside, you have to come back with, no, I won't. That's stupid. No, I won't. That's stupid. Stay safe, stay inside. No, I won't. That's yeah. stupid. That's how you have to fight indoctrination and propaganda. And I see so many people on Substack writing these massive research papers. And I'm like, that that's good. Break it up into 650 words and have it be multiple mm -hmm. parts. Um, don't do long tweets because people on Twitter are not reading long tweets. Okay. Put it in yeah. video and make that video five to 10 minutes and repeat that video mm -hmm. over. Take your tweets that you do put out and repost them every single day. Because if you look at the people that pushed vaccine confidence activities, which was actually funded um, in the uh, American Rescue Plan 2021 and actually started in 2014 with HHS, pretty soon after the death of bin Laden and the Smith-Munt Act was modernized, meaning they could propagandize Americans. But you flash forward ahead and it's just like, you know, you have to fight it with the tools they're using. You have to meet that frequency. So when we get there, you know, we have to have our drum beats. We have to have our graffiti. We have to use that framework to disrupt their frequency because this explaining in these long sub stacks, it doesn't work. Um, having talking to a double PhD and saying, Hey man, um, you know, don't get the vaccine because those three people just died when they got it and they go, it's safe and effective. It, like we have to in the future always recognize like 
okay, there's something bad that's happened to that person's brain. We have to recognize mm-hmm. that we're not dealing with a normal human now. We're dealing with someone who's had their brain broken. And so then we have to go just like you would with a child. And you have to say, no, <laughs> like, and keep it simple. And so that's why I'm saying this to encourage people because I see so many missed opportunities and people are just like, uh, well, I did this long video and I explained it and no one took it seriously. I'm like, no one read it. They maybe read mm-hmm. the first and last line of it. No one read it because they are just late. They're, they're, most people stay on any site for three minutes. I mean, you know what a bounce rate yeah. is. I mean, and you've seen those stats across the board. It's like you got to get the point out fast, concisely, repetitively, and with a lot of redundancy. Otherwise, no one's going to hear your frequency. Yeah, I, uh, I ran into that a lot during COVID. I don't judge me, but I was a Bernie progressive in 2016. Hey, um, I, I, I voted for Obama the first time around. I'm not judging yeah. anyone. We're Americans. You vote who, for who you want. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I don't believe socialism or communism is the answer, but there were some economic messages that Bernie really did touch on. And I thought I had that commonality with people I knew that I saw around me that agreed with that. Mm. So at the beginning of like COVID, before even the vaccines were a thing, I was looking at it economically economically and I'm saying, hey, we don't wanna we don't want to shut all these small businesses down because if we do that, all the money is going to go to Amazon. All of the money is going to go to Amazon and no nobody listened. Everyone adopted Amazon as their preferred place of doing business and Amazon stock went up 50% or 30%, whatever it was, it went up quite a bit. So exactly what I was saying would happen, which I'm not smart for saying that would happen. It was just common sense. It happened. And then, but nobody listened. And then you've touched on the BLM riots and stuff and riots and protests because some people were protesting, some people Mm -hmm. were rioting. I'm a I used to go to festivals a lot, um, like music, music festivals, festivals, raves, and uh, sorry, what music festivals? Yeah, music festivals, raves, things like mm-hmm. that. I like electronic music, and so I've seen that crowd a lot. Mm-hmm. And uh, people were isolated, like you said, right before the riots. And I remember sitting at home watching some live footage of people going out to protest. And I couldn't help but feel like it was a group of people that looked just like they were going to a festival. Mm -hmm. It didn't look like people that were going to a protest with some cause. It looked like people going to a festival, a social event, which was really weird for me to see Mm -hmm. because I'm like, this is a cause, but they're just, it's people just walking in a group and it's a social event for a lot of people. And I think that's what it was for a lot of people. Well, think about it. They've been locked up. And then all of a sudden, oh, we're allowed. If you, I mean, (laughs) I just thought about now, but it's like, God, that was genius of HHS. Like, well, you'll get people out there to a protest that don't even believe in the protest just because they're allowed to go protest, you know? So yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Cause it did remind me, I think, I think Occupy Wall Street was a bit, uh, Lollapalooza like, um, as well. I think that's where I really saw the change in protests. Like protests used to be serious things. And then all of a sudden yeah. it was like, like you said, I think a rave is, is really what I thought of. <laughs> like when you said that. Is yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I mean, it, I've been to raves and that's what it, I used to go to raves. That's what it looked like. Um, yeah. So I love them. What, what was that? Uh, there was a great band got back in the nineties and uh, not typo negative, but um Big rave band, and I, I'm just having a, a brain freeze here. But you said rave, and I just remember that's a big '90s thing too. When I was in the military, mm-hmm. and I used to go to some yeah. wild raves. There was one called the mm-hmm. Lost Children. It was in a giant circus tent just over the border in Mexico, and it was wild. Yeah. I mean, I loved I loved yeah. raves. Um, but yeah, I mean, I saw that too, and it was like a rave. And there is some at some point we'll, we'll have to talk about. There is the manipulation of audio rhythms that may be imperceptible to you, but they're kind of, it's the same concept of, you know, you've been to raves, like you'll understand this. 
have you ever noticed like, you know, I used to go to like corn concerts and, and white mm-hmm. zombie and, you know, and, uh, corn, especially like they would get the crowd going and then the whole crowd is bouncing in unison. Yeah. Okay. So when you, you can actually manipulate frequencies via garbage cans with those Bluetooth, you know, the garbage cans that you see with the solar power and all that. Um, yeah. also from police cars, also from public buildings barely audible. And this is something I've seen done is something we've done overseas where you get a certain, certain rhythms will invoke, will, will bring about certain emotions in people. You can get an aggressive rhythm. You mm. can get, and these things are done. And these things have been done to this population, especially during COVID that will get people into this, this rhythm and you get the right rhythm. You get aggression, you get joy, you get fear, you get lust, you get all sorts of things. You could just manipulate the rhythm and then surround, you know, visually stimulate people with graffiti that has Mm. people with masks and certain people look a little more aggressive. You could go to CDC's website and look up a PDF called engaging the arts for COVID vac uh, for vaccine confidence. They actually Mm. CDC hired people to do most of that graffiti you saw on the streets that that was pro lockdown and everything. So, but you combine all these things and you stir it to a frenzy and then people break and they also become addicted to that because that gets the adrenaline going. Adrenaline is highly addictive. Um, yeah. And then you, then once you get to that point, think of it like if covert influence is like building a record player, once you've built that record player, you just have to change the record because if you notice same tone, same signage, same talking points, almost and as my son pointed out, same emergency text message that was used for COVID, they just shifted it into Ukraine. Yeah. So I started getting announcements about Ukraine and kids wearing the Ukrainian colors in these uh, Massachusetts area schools. But it, it was my son at 10 who pointed out, hey, dad, isn't that weird that it's the same number that came from COVID? The COVID alerts? Yeah. I said, yeah, that is weird because that number is owned by the local HHS. Yeah. You see what I mean? I heard you're, uh, it's a tool. I heard you. I heard you tell a story about how your son challenged the principal to find uh, <laughs> Kiev on a map. Yeah, you want me to tell that one? <laughs> sure. I'll make it quick. Good, I don't want to keep you too much. No, longer, I gotta go. Sure. He's been patient. He's well. He's probably talking. He's he's in he's in the girlfriend age, so I'm sure he's fine. But um, yeah, no, he uh, he had told me that, and I'll, I'll I'll send you the graphic for the tweet because it's right when he said it. So I. I I happened to get a picture uh, of him being kind of funny about it, but he takes pride in knowing things, which I like. And so yeah. I get this call and uh, the principal wants me to come in. I'm like, that's fine. And his mother was out of town. So I go in and I'm, I'm ready to rock. I mean, this isn't the height of things. It's like what? 2022. Was that when uh, Ukraine started? See, my memory has been yeah, fried so. too. Um, so it's pretty soon thereafter. And, uh, he, um, showed me this text saying, oh, you know, we're encouraging the kids to wear Ukrainian colors, blah, blah, blah. And that's the one that came in on that HHS line. And so then the next day I get called in and I'm ready to, I'm like, I'm going to probably deck this principal if he tries to other my son for not wearing Ukrainian. That's what I'm ramping up to. Uh, I get in and, um, you know, my son's back in class and principal. <laughs> shakes my hand and I go, okay. And then, um, I said, why am I here? And he's like, I just, look, I, I just wanted to kind of, I knew you were coming in anyways to pick up your son. I just want to say, whatever you guys are doing at home, keep doing it. And I say, well, okay. And he's like, no. And he explained to me how his Alex's teacher had said, why aren't, why aren't you going to wear Ukrainian colors tomorrow? And Alex said, well, um, I've been reading on the history of Ukraine and the history of this relationship we have with Ukraine. Uh, I know what a color revolution is because he reads all that stuff. And he's, he's around me and Naomi like all day long when we're with him. Yeah. And, uh, and he's like, and um, I'm sorry, but I'm going to, until I, until I have more data about why we're even caring about Ukraine, he said, I'm going to sit this one out. And he goes respectfully and um, the teacher sent him to the principal's office like he's in trouble. So when he got to the principal's office, according to the principal, um, you know, he, 
he, the principal said that Alex had said, uh, he says, so Alex, what's the problem? I mean, this, he's like, well, I can wear anything I want. You know that you can't legally make me wear anything unless this is a private school and you want me to wear a uniform. And the principal was like, no, no, of course no, totally get that. But can you just explain why you wouldn't want to? And he said, can you explain why you'd want me to? And then the principal said, uh, well, okay, now we're getting, it's getting a, my sense of t- tell you what he goes, tell you what, this is exactly his affect. He's like, dad, dad, dad. like when he talks to me, he's always like that, 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 that wait, respectfully, respectfully. I wish Naomi never told him, res- taught him that word respectfully. Cause he totally abuses <laughs> it. He's like, he's like Ricky Bobby, like all due respect, you know, but um, he uh, said to the principal, he goes, I'll, I'll, I'll make a deal with you. That globe over on the shelf there, he said, if you could go over that globe in under five seconds from the time you leave your desk and point to Kiev on a map, on that map, I will come in with Ukrainian colors tomorrow. And then that was Mm -hmm. it. And principal couldn't (laughs) couldn't find it. And so my son stopped the spinning and helped him out. And that was it. So principal said, well, why don't you head on back to class? (laughs) And that was the end of it. But I was very impressed with that. And uh, it, it should be a warning to all parents. Like this is why we have to be involved in, in, yeah. in everything. And, and like you said earlier is look for those signs. That's another sign of indoctrination when the educators are chanting something that they don't even know about. That's some Maoist China stuff right there, man. Yeah. yeah. Hey, can I, I ask you story. a quick question? Oh. I love that tree yeah. back there. What does that represent? Oh, it's the tree of life. Okay. I've always loved the tree of life symbol I, or for a long time I've liked it. And uh, it's not like an expensive thing. I just bought it off of Amazon. No, it's really nice. Black light up there. And, yeah. I've Naomi's, liked it. Um, Naomi's whole family and like her mother and her, you know, her mother is a uh, uh, practices in her profession. A lot of uh, more, more of the esoteric in terms of like um, what's going on in your brain and your soul and everything. And, uh, you'd, you'd love to meet her. Off, but, you know, if you ever want, I'll let you talk to her, but she's, she's done like, uh, like a past life regression session on me and everything. Mm-hmm. And I, I, you know, I was obviously pretty skeptical, but she had a very successful practice in New York. I, I rumor has it that Shaquille O'Neal was one of her clients. It's my mother-in-law, mm-hmm. but, Interesting. um, the past life regression, if you're, and she also is, well, Naomi's a, Naomi always tells me she's a witch, but she's also very in touch. She's a good witch, but she's also very yeah. in touch with uh, the earth and the tree because that's where I recognize it was from her house as the tree of life. You'd really, you'd really probably really enjoy a conversation. She is my yeah, favorite. She's the best mother-in-law ever. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. It has an Ouroboros around it and then obviously like the moon and stuff like that in it too. That's really just nice. like the when I found it. Um, I know you have to get going. So honestly, I would love to have you back on here in the yeah, near let's future keep because talking. there there's more that I wanted to ask you about when we got on different sure. subjects and I loved it. But well what uh, I'd like to do, yeah. I'd love to have you on our, our show as well. And um yeah. you know, and we want to do a panel of different age groups. So I'm just shy of fifty and JJ's fifty four and you're about ten years younger, and we want to get a panel of people talking about everything. Uh, for the sake of the yeah. politicians, but I'd also love to have you on just to get in the mix. You know, it's, it's a lot of fun. Awesome. Yeah, I would love it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, before we wrap up, uh, I always like to ask people if they have any books they recommend it, mm. recommend you already mentioned a few and then feel free to share anywhere people can find you, your sub stack on the daily cloud. Um, on your ex, yes. anything you want to share. Uh, yeah. So um, find us on dailyclout.io. You'll see right on the front page. There are wonderful programs. We have a, uh, ours is Unrestricted Invasion. That is myself and JJ Carroll. Naomi's Outspoken. It's her Substack. It's also her video cast, also her podcast. She also does Geneva Bible readings, which are amazing. Um, even if you're not religious, she really goes into the deep history of the differences in translation. And she's discovered a few things, which has blown my mind. Um, Kate Hildreth is our creative director, but she does something really cool. She's in her twenties and her and her husband, who I met really nice guy, they bought an Amish, like uh, it's like a wood stove store. And they're, they've been turning it into this home. 
and they take you through every step of everything they're doing and they're learning as they go. And I actually watched her video uh, to figure out how to patch up a hole in my house because we had a leak and we had to cut through the, the ceiling. Uh, she's doing that. She's also doing the rogue millennial, um, uh, where she really gets a lot of good opinions from that millennial age group. And, you know, so certainly everyone should tune into that. My sub stack is, um, uh, Brian O'Shea, just Brian O'Shea, um, what is it? Forward slash sub stack. Um, and then, um, it's investigate everything. And then, um, there was one more that I wanted to point out. Oh yeah. And then at Brian O'Shea SPI. Um, and then at Brian O'Shea on, um, on, uh, getter. But the, um, if you really want to get to know me a little better and see what a, uh, child I am, uh, certainly go to my YouTube, which is investigate everything where I have very serious stuff on there, but I also have entire videos dedicated to teaching Naomi how to shoot a slingshot and then filtering in some Western good, the bad and the ugly music. And, um, you know, blowing up a rutabaga and then resorting to a shotgun because my, my, my experiment didn't work. So I, I put it all out there and it's a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah. So just reach out to us anytime and, uh, it, I'd love to be back. This has been a real pleasure. Really enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah. I, I as far really as books, I would, can I, uh, if I may, yeah. the book I would recommend to everyone. Okay. Is, um, well, there's two I would recommend. We have been harmonized, okay, and uh, I will let you put up the author's name because I can't pronounce it off the cuff. And But We Have Been Harmonized really talks about the digitization of China and how it's been used to lock down their people from the inside. I highly recommend that book. Um, it's a warning, if anything, and it's, a, I think, a Swedish or Danish author. It's very, you know, he's no fan of Trump. He's no doesn't give a any he doesn't care about democrat or republican he's from you know that the, the the neutral yeah. countries um but we have been harmonized and the other one i highly recommend to everyone it's two books actually but general spalding general robert spalding um he wrote two books that are about unrestricted warfare and once you read them you can't unread them and they are eye opening mm -hmm. not so much for me but he really really gets it he was an attaché to a Pentagon attache to uh, China um, for a long time. He admits in the beginning of the book, he totally never thought there were anything but competitors that he learned, but he has stealth wars, which or stealth war, I'm sorry, which um, talks about unrestricted warfare. He gets into like Amazon marketplace, which pretty much is Alibaba, which I didn't know. And um, he gets into all of this and he gets into, you know, the, all these methodology, all these methods of war, all these vectors that the Chinese have been using for a long time uh, to to defeat or disintegrate America, and that's called stealth war by retired General Air Force General Robert Spaulding. And then his follow-on to that is actually called War Without Rules. Um, that came out about two years ago. I I met uh, General Spaulding through reading his books, and um, we've been a co-signatory on um, the. A, a paper by Michael Singer, but I've never had any direct interaction with him. I just really love the way he explains things because war without rules, he goes through unrestricted warfare. Okay. Which is free. You could get unrestricted warfare online. I just happen to have this spaghetti stained copy that I printed out that I was using for, but as you can see right there, it's like, see the, uh, the publisher. It is a PLA. Oh, yeah. It's, you could get that online. But what he does, he goes through this uh, unrestricted warfare from 1999, and then he puts it in Western terms. Because if you've ever read yeah. anything that's translated by from Mandarin, it, gets, it does get a little flowery. Um, and so he will go through each chapter in War Without Rules. Um, like, for instance, he'll say... This is an example. Sorry to ramble on, but this, I think, is very important. Um, yeah, he will say, for instance, um, the war god's face has become indistinct. That is the name of the chapter. So you see, mm. 
And then he goes on to explain uh, what this means and how the Chinese, how the CCP has applied their war principles based on the war god's face changing. Who is the war god? What does that look like? And he really breaks it out into, okay, that is this firm. That is this transaction. That's happening now in this state. And so what I like about it is it's a real eye opener. I don't think it gets the credit it deserves um, or the amplification, but the two books by General Robert Spaulding, I just cannot recommend enough. And they transcend China. I mean, they, 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 yeah. it goes into communism. Um, so yeah. So I would say both books by Robert Spaulding and then a, we have been harmonized is just haunting. Awesome. Well, Brian, I really appreciate the book rep- recommendations. No I love the conversation oh, I'm sorry. and I absolutely and everything by Naomi Wolf. I highly recommend. Oh yeah. yeah. Definitely. Um, I love the conversation. Uh, let's definitely arrange for you to come back and I would love to participate in anything you'd have me with. So. Sounds good. I'll, I'll invite my son on if you want him. <laughs> he could, <laughs> oh, yeah, awesome. He's quite a guy. <laughs> and so is my daughter. So, yeah. well, thanks for having me. This is really, uh, and I, I learned a lot from you too, especially about the insights of the people you talk to and, and your approach and, uh, and hope to see you on a space soon. Um, yeah, definitely. And uh, definitely uh, give a shout out to Bill Elmore for bringing people like us together. There is, there's some good that yeah. comes out of technology. So that's good. So. Absolutely. All right, Brian, I hope you have a great day and thank you for joining you me. You as well. Thanks. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave a five-star review on Spotify and Apple. It goes a long way in helping the podcast grow and reach more listeners. You can also like and subscribe on YouTube. And if you want to support the show, you can go to FractalZoo.net where I have unique Fractal-inspired clothing. Each purchase goes directly toward helping the podcast grow. I'll also leave my Amazon affiliate link in the description. You can click on that before making an Amazon purchase and a small commission may go to the podcast. I love to connect with my audience, so find me on Twitter or X at RDTM podcast. That's A R T I E T M podcast. Or you can find me on Instagram at Thoughtfully Mindless. Thank you for listening today. That's it for this one. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless. <laughs>